Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Women in Leadership Talk podcast. I have a very exciting guest for us today. We're going to be talking women in politics, but it's not just about politics. It's about women and uh, the importance of our representation in all aspects of life. So I want to welcome Mary Hayashi. Mary, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Vicki, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Good, good, good. Well, we've got a lot of lot to talk about. So I'm going to you know, welcome our audience here. So audience, thank you. We know you have a choice as to what you listen to and what you're taking in. And we're super grateful that you're joining us. And uh, we are now being listened to, I think, in 44 countries. So thank you for everyone for your support and encouragement to keep the podcast going. Uh, and we just celebrated our 100th episode at the end of 2023. Um, so, you know, we're just going to keep going and bringing great content to you. And if there's things that you'd like to hear about, please do reach out to us and let us know other content that would be exciting for you. But more about that later. Let's get into Mary. So let me give you a little background on um, who Mary is. So she is a former California State Assembly member. She released a new book in October of 2023. Is that correct, Mary? Just at yes. the end of the year? Yes. And her book is Women in Politics, Breaking Down the Barriers to Achieve True Representation. So let you just have a look at that so you have a visual. Um, I spent my Christmas break <laughs> at the end of 2023 reading Mary's book. And I have to tell you, and I was just sharing this with Mary, so many great insights um, of you know how she has shared and brought stories to life of many iconic women. Um, and, and so we're gonna get into that in a moment, but this she's an award-winning author and healthcare leader. And she has done some great exploration uh, of the strides that women have made in government. And this essential contemporary analysis bridges the gap between the past and the present, blending Mary's own personal journey as an, as an Asian American immigrant and former California State Assembly member with the inspiring stories of many other trailblazing women in political leadership. So she's featured a lot of interviews and insightful discussions and brings to life the trials and triumphs of these women, showcasing invaluable contributions to political landscapes and the transformative power of perseverance. She's also shedding light on struggles uh, for gender political parity and serves as a call to action where we all must actively participate in shaping our democracy. So Women in Politics is not just a book, it's a tribute to women's political journey and a compass guiding us all toward a future of inclusive leadership and a truly representative democracy. And I stress some of that because, as I said, I found her book to be highly uh, enlightening and insightful, not only for politics, but for women stepping into their power and leading and, and being representatives. So, Mary, thank you so much. I know I said a lot there. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Vicki. I um, I really enjoy um, doing podcasts. I don't. I didn't really know how um, how they worked, you know, initially. And I um, after I published my book, um, my publicist said, you know, there's some of these great women leadership, women in political space with this podcast opportunity. And it's, I love it because we can really get into specifics and have, you know, lengthy discussions about, you know, what's important for women. So I, I'm really honored to be part of your um, show. And I really want to thank you for, for including us because, um, and I say us because the book represents about 17 women and one man, um, personal journeys, you know, I try to do, you know, I try to incorporate the interviews and research mm -hmm. um, to prove that women's political representation and participation matters. So thank you. Yeah, no, we're thrilled to have you here. And so agree, like our voices have to be heard in order for there to be change. And sometimes we don't realize even it can be the small things that have significant impact. So so let's jump in to our conversation. And, you know, one of the things that intrigued me as I was reading was when you start talking about the imagination barrier. So maybe you could just share 
you know, where that comes from and, and how you've seen that played out in the political arena. Yes, yes. Um, and I love talking about this because it's it's this is not political. This is our experience. You know, this is women's experience. So um, so imagination barrier is also referred to um, political scientists as the role model effect. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, simply what that means is that you can't be what you can't see. Yeah. And um, one of the women that I interviewed for the book, Amanda Hunter, who's the president of the um, Barbara Lee Family Foundation, um, talked about uh, the organization's recent focus group research when participants were asked to picture a governor, an overwhelming majority um, envisioned a man. Mm -hmm. And so this phenomenon is, you know, is a version of what we commonly sort of refer to as unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is not just, you know, men envisioning a man. This is all I'm talking about women participants as well. Um, and so we can't really envision a female president until recently because we've had, you know, women, um, you know, run, you know, run for president and vice president, you know, and ran as a vice president. And, and when we see these role models, then we can envision women doing those jobs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, same thing in the corporate sector, I'm sure. Um, I'm not an expert, but you know, we, we still have a lot more men represented um, at the top. And so, you know, sometimes we can't imagine seeing a different kind of person doing these kinds of jobs. And so that's what imagination barrier is. And I talk about my own imagination barrier because I came here as an immigrant. I grew, I was born and raised in Korea mm -hmm. and we were supposed to be, you know, good girls, meaning we, you know, we go to school and and look for like our perfect mate and get married and have children. And that's sort of like our path. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we weren't even allowed to like make eye contact with people, let alone call, you know, strangers for political campaign contributions. I mean, those yeah. things were uh, not allowed. Um, and so my upbringing really set these barriers um, around my imagination. So mm -hmm. we all have that, you know, and I think that um, what I try to do in the book is to to sort of talk about my own imagination barrier as as a good, you know, as somebody who had this good girl training. Um, but what other women, um, successful women in politics have also experienced. And I also want to add that um, it's it's also true for men mm -hmm. um, because, you know, men need examples, too. Exactly. You know, and, you know, it's essential for them to to see that that men in supporting positions, as it is for women to see that, you know, women in leadership positions. And so mm -hmm. one thing that's really great about our current vice president, Kamala Harris, is that she has a spouse who really enjoys um, his job, you know, as a second gentleman. Mm -hmm. And I think he you know, when you when you look back, like Sarah Palin's campaign, for instance, um, people mocked her husband for staying, you know, being a stay at home dad. And and while she campaigns, you know, he had to he was kind of the dad who took care of the kids and people really disrespect, disrespected him for that. And and so it's great to see that that we have somebody who actually embraces and enjoy supporting a very powerful woman in that position. So when we talk about imagination barrier, it's not just girls or women, but men need role models as well um, so that they can support women in powerful positions. Yeah, I totally agree, Mary. And it's so interesting you say this because one of the things I've been working on in at the uh, 2023 that I, I was really focused on is how do we showcase more of our male allies? And it was quite fascinating because so many were hesitant to step up, even though they were silently. So kind of that, you know, invisible um, to support women. And I did an event in, at our, in our capital in Canada in May, and it was the first time I had 50-50 representation, men and women. Yes. And the men were all nodding their heads. Say, yes. Tell us, how do we be better allies? So to your point, 
they were looking for examples of other male allies, but also looking for us to give them feedback to help them be better allies. So, so it is a it is a combination of both men and women. So let, let, I'm, I'm just going to tap into something you talked about a minute ago when you were talking about your upbringing with regards to that silent good girl um, or being invisible, not being able to make eye contact. So what are what are some of those consequences when we when we, you know, are invisible? I guess that's the best way I know how to say it. Yes. And um, I mean, there are just, you know, the, the entire book is really about highlighting some of these challenges and barriers that women experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, and I do I do try to offer by providing some of these examples of how to overcome them. Right. Um, you know, and so the, 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 sim the most simplest of way to sort of explain this, and I try to break it down to three specific sort of barriers um, that women talked about and also through my own experience that I try to talk about um, is, uh, you know, this sort of, you know, imagination barriers, obviously a big one. Um, but we also, um, you know, try to be light because there's such a likability double standards when it comes to women in leadership roles. Um, you know, we, you know, we're supposed to, you know, we're supposed to be liked and competent and qualified to be considered, um, you know, to run for office. And men, you know, they, voters will vote for male candidates, even if they don't like them, if they think that they're qualified. So those are some of the issues that I also try to address because likability double standard is, 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 is a really big problem. Um, and um, another barrier that I talk about um, is a qualification and ambition gap. Mm -hmm. and so what I, what I mean by that is when, you know, when you are raised to be good girls um, and you can't really talk about what you want or what, what you want to do, um, you know, have to, like, for instance, have a career or be a mom or, you know, it has to be your choice, but you know, I was raised to sort of pursue a particular path. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you when you have that sort of, you know, good girl mentality, then you don't really have the ambition to um, pursue a leadership position. Mm -hmm. Men, they pursue politics because they want to be leaders. Very similar to, you know, men start their own companies because they want to be the CEO. They want to be their own boss. You know, they want to make more money. Um, women often start their own business because they want to be flexible and they want to be available, you know, for their kids and, and have more flexibility in their schedule so they can accommodate their family members needs. And so, um, both, you know, just in terms of like our ambition, you know, you know, to be ambitious as a girl is something that is not, you know, looked upon as a favorable trait. Like if, if someone says, oh, Vicky is very ambitious, that's usually said in a negative light, whereas for men, that's expected. Um, and so what happens from very young age? You know, we're not we're taught not to be ambitious. We're we're supposed to not seek leadership position. We're supposed to get along with everyone and uh, build coalition. And um, there's you know there's all these studies about how women work in bipartisan fashion because you know we don't like conflict and because we're supposed to get along with everyone. And those are some of the positive traits I think that you know women do bring to the table. Um, but it's okay to have a conflict and it's, of course okay it is. <laughs> have, yeah, I mean, it's okay to be ambitious and want to have a leadership role and it's okay to do that. And so I think, you know, for me, I, it took a really long time and I think it, I still struggle with this even now. Um, oh, it, should I speak now? You know, like if I'm in a meeting or something like that, I'll ask mm -hmm. myself, like, is this important enough for me to, to speak? 
And so that training, that good girl training really stays with you. And it takes um, enormous amount of effort on my part to sort of deprogram and, and overcome those barriers and just, you know, rethink about what, you know, what I could do or what I could say, and it's still okay. And so one of the goals in writing this book um, is to, you know, inspire other women to write their own life path and to see that we don't have to be controlled by our backgrounds, ethnicities, or family histories, you know, because I'm not really supposed to be doing this. Let alone write a <laughs> yeah. book. <laughs> well, that was, that was culturally, that's what they were thinking, right? That you weren't supposed to do this, but somebody else had a higher plan for you, Mary, <laughs> to be that voice and, and to speak out and speak up. And, so I just want to comment on a couple of things you just said there, because there is also nothing wrong to being more thoughtful about when you speak up, right? Because oftentimes what we see happen, and I'm, gentlemen, I apologize to you in advance, but this is, this is what happens many times. Men will speak up for the sake of just speaking, not thoughtful necessarily about what is coming out where women will hold back and reserve a little bit to try to put all the pieces together before we actually speak up. And so there is that, I think there's a balance on both sides <laughs> with regards to being intentional and thoughtful about how and what we're bringing up. That's just one thought. And then something you said earlier that that is true, and I see this in the corporate world a lot, where you know, let's say there's an opportunity available and men will put their hand up if they think they're 60% qualified. Women have to be able to tick off all the boxes. And, and that's one of the things I work on with clients is stop worrying about ticking off all the boxes. <laughs> put your hand up, put yourself yeah. out there. You, you're smart, you're capable, you're competent. You'll figure it out once you're in the role. So I, I think there are there are those barriers that we put in place that prevent us from stepping out. Right, right. And it's funny that you mentioned that um, 60% statistics, because I do reference that in the book, because there's a very similar study that looked at, you know, um, how women make their decisions about running for office. And it's same thing with, you know, declaring candidacy because women who are qualified view themselves not qualified to run for office. Um, whereas men, if they, you know, if they met 60% of the qualifications, they would nominate themselves and say, well, I'm qualified to run for office. And um, what was really interesting about this one particular study called Men Rule is that even men who rated themselves not qualified to run for office still said that they would run anyway. And so, uh, and so that's really, you know, that's sort of like the three gaps that I talked about earlier, the ambition gap, um, the qualification gap and, um, and the imagination barrier and the likability double standard is that, you know, men are encouraged to le seek leadership positions and they're supposed to be ambitious. Whereas, you know, we're not, um, and so even when we are qualified, we don't view ourselves as qualified for candidate. So that's been a real barrier to entry. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say that's probably one of the biggest consequences with when that confidence is not there, it prevents you from stepping into those roles. And, you know, that's, you don't, we don't have to have all the answers. We have to be able to surround ourselves with great people. And, you know, figure out how we work better together than it having to be us that knows everything. Um, and and I, to me, that is a that is a um, consequence when we have that silent good girl um, mindset. Right. Because, you know, I mean, I fortunately I was raised to, you know, behave myself. <laughs> but at the same time. I was probably more outspoken and my mother would have to pull me back <laughs> because I was so outspoken, but she still encouraged me. Right. So it's that, it's that balancing of how, how we can do both. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, 
There's a really funny study that um, that I referenced, um, New York Times article. Um, there was a New York Times study and an article that titled um, Fewer Women Run Big Companies um, Than Men Named John. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was fascinating. So there's like more Johns than women, like collectively. And I thought, and then they actually did a follow up, um, you know, to, to kind of track women in politics and, you know, same thing. And so, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting because studies have shown that women are, you know, women run very competitive campaigns and they can raise, you know, money. I mean, they have, they get less in terms of the dollar amounts, but, you know, they can run competitively and they, they win at the same rate as men. Mm-hmm. So the, the so the barrier really seems to be, you know, that we can't get women to do it. Like if they do it, they have a chance, but we have that barrier. You know, we have this, oh, I'm not qualified, you yeah. know, and, um, you know, I, I need to, I need to have all the experiences and I need to, I need more experience. I need to, I need more qualifications. Um, and, you know, motherhood, I have, there's a chapter on motherhood about motherhood and the politics around that and so you know for women our decision making process is very different yeah you no know, and i've never watched a presidential debate where somebody would ask the moderator or ask a man like oh so how does your fatherhood impact having kids impact your you know your campaign you know they, they don't really ask those kinds of questions but then they think that about women or they would ask that or, or have a different set of expectations for women candidates running for a president. So I think we got a long way to go, but um, the fact that, you know, your podcast and there's so many other women talking about these issues and raising these points, I think will definitely make a difference. I yeah, do. I agree, Mary. And, and what you were just describing there, I think is so important because those are systemic issues that only we can start to break down, right? Like yes. we've got to start to challenge those things. And I was reading, and I can't remember off the top of my head where I read this from the other day, but um, it was talking about women in next level leadership, like not senior, but the, j- climbing the ladder, we're walking away for a lot of the same reasons you're talking about. And so it's how do we continue to get women into these seats because they are capable. Um, we're highly organized because we do have families <laughs> oftentimes, <laughs> right? So so there are some systemic barriers and issues that we need to start to break down, right? And, and seeing men and women as human beings, not what sex we are, right? Not what gender we are. And, and so that kind of leads me into my next question for you. Like I'm sensing and seeing more of this rise of femininity, uh, female attributes doesn't mean f- women, but the female attributes. And yet there's still so much pushback from men in power. And and this is men and women who are wanting to express more of that authentic side. Um, but we're still getting that pushback. So what are some ways that you've been able to use your feminine power as an advantage in, in the political arena? So, yeah, I, you know, I, this is such an interesting conversation um, because when we look at women in politics, just as an example, um, because more women serving in government now, we have been able to, you know, have significant advancement in health, you know, healthcare, um, education opportunities, like women's rights, women's reproductive rights. And so a lot of these really important public policy issues mm-hmm. are, you know, they, they correlate with more women serving in government. Mm-hmm. And so I definitely think that, you know, we, you know, women, you know, and, and, and another study that talks about how women sponsor significantly more legislation than their male counterparts and so it's not to say that men don't do important legislation but of course you know we women run for office because they want to solve problems yes I mean that's just it's just very simple (laughs) you know whereas men tend to run this is you know these are the these are some of the studies that exist out there men tend to run because they seek a leadership position and there's nothing wrong with that 
Um, you know, but like Bill Clinton, like he said, he wanted to run for president because he met a president. You know, he, yes. he, he, he connected, you know, he got to go to the White House when JFK was the president and he said, oh, I'm going to have that job someday. Yeah. And that was his reason. <laughs> Whereas women run for office because they want to fix a specific problem. Yeah. And, you know, recently you hear more about women running for office now, like this year, because of reproductive rights issues. Oh, and so yes. <laughs> when women run for office in, in, in sort of political spheres, we, you know, we tend to do it because we have a personal mission. Yeah. And so when we bring that and we start to talk about those issues that are very personal um, and using our own sort of personal experiences and journeys um, as a reason for running. And, and once you get to, you know, once you, once you win and once you're in leadership position, we use that experience to solve a particular societal problem. And so he, just a tremendous opportunity for, for electing women and using our own power um, for, you know, greater good. And I think when voters see that, um, you know, they, they do look at us. I mean, there are barriers, like I, we talked about earlier, but when you ask the voters about, you know, women's ability to, to make a difference in these areas, it's very clear we have advantages over men. I mean, that is, you know, voters do think that we can address healthcare better, for instance, or women's issues, foster care issues, um, you know, homelessness. A lot of these uh, issues that don't have a traditional voice or representation we are given sort of benefit of the doubt that we can do it better than men. So that is one area that that I really want to talk about where, you know, I, you know, I got interested in politics because I lost my older sister to suicide when she was a teenager. And, you know, I'm from a very um, traditional Asian family where, you know, my parents decided that, you know, she just was going to be erased from our memories and our, you know, family and just, they got rid of her photos and, you know, they decided not to tell anyone about her. Like we can't even talk about what happened to her as a family. Um, so they really didn't know how to deal with this issue. And, you know, when I got older and educated and I thought, I want to know what happened to her. And we really need to stop this nonsense about stigmatizing mentally ill people because then they can't ask for help as long yeah. as there's discrimination and stigma. And so that really motivated me to do more in the public policy arena. And so I came to this line of work um, wanting to make a difference for people who are suffering in silence from mental illness. And I'm not that special because everyone that I interviewed for my book had a similar story where they lost someone or they experienced a personal tragedy and that that really was the motivation for them um, to pursue public you know, policy work and political work. And so I think we can use that. Women have done a great job of not only bringing those issues and talking about them, but excelling, you know, a, a, a really good at advocating for those personal issues and then making making the public policy better for everyone yeah so so we you know so there are some exciting things that we can showcase about you know what women bring to this line of work yeah no i don't disagree with you and you know i think that what i hear there is women are very purpose-driven um and and so that purpose is what drives you to achieve or solve the problem. Um, so it's bigger than just the problem. It, it's really the purpose. So it's what's what's driving you internally, right? And there's this shift, I think, energetically in the world where feminine is very much needed. And, and there's a lot of men who are wanting to be able to express their wholeness because they also are put into stereotypes of they need to be tough and masculine and aggressive and da 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 and so I'm I'm cognizant of that and I want to make sure that you know we're capturing the full essence and and so it's a how do we harmonize the two right because 
we're 50, 51, 49% of the population. <laughs> so how do we start to have both that femininity? Because, because in past, when women did make it into these roles, and this is where Hillary Clinton took such a, such a beating, yeah. was that she was more of that masculine leader. So you put a dress on her, but her, she was tough, right? And had to be, had to be. And so oftentimes we see this happening when women get into leadership roles. Um, and I think you talk about this in the book too, of why so many women don't support other women. And, and this is not just politics. This is corporate worlds as well. Yes. Well, it's definitely because of that unconscious bias, but, um, you know, I, it really has, I just go back to that good girl upbringing again, <laughs> because, um, one of my favorite authors, Peggy Orenstein, um, did this great book. It's, um, uh, about this, it's, it's called the school girls. And it was a big study around, you know, girls and how we deal with conflict. Mm. And because we're supposed to just get along, we can't really, we're not supposed to have like this open debate about our disagreements. Yeah. And so we just were raised sort of, you know, not to be able to deal with some of those issues in a more um, masculine sort of open way. Whereas men, they will just argue about it and then they'll just sort of move on. And then I just love this quote from, I don't know if you saw the movie Barbie. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a quote um, where, you know, the daughter says, you know, women hate women, men hate women. That's the only thing we have in common. I don't know if you recall that. Um, and, you know, but but ultimately, you know, women do sort of build coalition to to beat the Ken. So that's good. Um, but I think there's just a lot of us out there with very little sort of mentoring and training around um, how, you know, how we deal with conflict and how we work with other women. And I was very fortunate because I was in my early 20s and I wanted to start this nonprofit organization that worked on Asian American women and mental health. And I received enormous amount of support from other women feminist leaders um, who thought that having an Asian American women's organization was a great idea. Um, and so I, you know, so I, I received enormous amount of support from other women. Um, and that's very unusual, but at the same time, my, um, you know, executive director, my first boss, um, at the, my real job, uh, who was also an Asian American woman who opposed me for like 10 years, just did not want me to do anything and just was really not supportive. Um, and so I've all, you know, I've also had that experience and I, you know, being, you know, when you were young, when you're like 23, 26 years old, I started working for when I was 23 and then at 26, I started my own organization. You don't really know how to process you know, that kind of information because you have these other examples of role models who are mentoring you and helping you, but you also have this woman who talks a good game, but can't really mentor or support other women who are trying to be leaders. Um, so that was really tough for me. And, um, and, and that's when I started reading a lot about, you know, feminist and women's movement and just to, just to kind of help you know better understand you know why these things happen um but it's just you know on multiple levels i think we do have women yes we do have women who support other women but we clearly don't have women who don't vote for other women we yeah. see that i mean if women voted for women hillary clinton would be our president for instance but women clearly you know have their own standards about what women leaders should look like mm -hmm. and so it's um you know there's a lot of research done on this and there really isn't a sort of a one solution um to this problem but it does happen and we do we need to recognize it and we need to be able to um have pub, sort of conflict in you know endorse and embrace um more open dialogue about how we 
handle conflict between women? Because I think that really is a big challenge for us. You know, we don't want to say anything and it just becomes a really big problem. Yeah. That's on a personal level. And then on an institutional level, we often get into this. And 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 for me, for, for being an Asian American woman, especially, they think having one woman, one Asian woman, like serves all the, you know, diversity quota. Mm, and so yes. we're also kind of up against that, where in a sort of a more of an institutional level, you know, they try to divide women, you know, like, oh, we already have women on the board. Yeah. One, one is enough. And so I think for a lot of women, they only see sort of like a limited spot, you know, like if, if for men, they don't have to worry about that. But for us, there could only be one. So if there's only one Asian woman um, already accepted by mainstream organizations as the spokesperson, then there can't be any additional Asian women organizations. Um, which and- which plays into your imagination barrier, I think, right? Like it's not imagination, it is happening, but but that's one of those there's one of the stories that we tell ourselves. And so it's how do we how do we then navigate that, right? Like because there is room. <laughs> there is room. We just have to make the room. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so go ahead. So Mary, what, because I'm just cognizant of our timing here, but what, so we've covered a lot of issues, a lot of circumstances that uh, create the barriers and the unconscious biases. Sometimes it's conscious biases. So how does a woman in politics in particular, but also other uh, industries, how do you maintain that confidence when you feel like others are doubting your abilities. Yes, and and that um, you know the discouragement and the and the doubts and all of those things are just like continuous. And in my book, I talk about how it's it's never just one magic moment. It's you know it's, a, it's an ongoing. Um, a struggle and ongoing learning process and experience. And it's, so it just, because like you have one endorsement, that doesn't mean you're going to get all the other endorsements. It it just doesn't work like that. So yes, there is a lot of negativity and there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of pushback. And I was, I use my own experience to talk about how um, when I ran for state assembly, I, I had Tipper Gore's endorsement and I had all these like very powerful women backing me. And I was so excited. I thought, you know, God, I have all this experience and I thought I was all that. And I reached out to my local party chairwoman. She was a woman and, and I told her, you know, my experience and my endorsements. And I I said, you know, I raised all this money already and I really want your support. And, and she said to me, um, well, I don't think you can win, you know, because you don't really have any experience running for local office, like for any office. And so why don't you, why don't you run for like something small first, you know, like a hospital board or city mm. council. And, and so, you know, to this day, I remember that because I was like, so shocked, you know, like, okay. Um, but yes, so that that will happen. You will get discouraged, and people will express, you know, um, you know, through their lens whether you're, you know, they'll say whether you're qualified or not, and you sort of have to accept that and just move forward. Um, this, you know, I love Lafonza Butler's quote because I think that describes sort of my own um, belief and. Um, also is a great um, advice to other women. You know, I asked her like, what what do you tell young people given all these barriers, you know, if they're thinking about running for office? And she says, you know, I would say do it anyway. Yes, and exactly. That's, yeah, and that's, you know, that's kind of what I did. I, um, you know, when I start, wanted to start this organization, my boss, sort of my mentor at the time said, you know, um, that I just, I had nothing to offer. I wasn't really ready. I wasn't experienced enough. And 
And she really discouraged me and I just went ahead and did it anyway. And, um, and hugely a successful organization and, you know, raised over like $10 million and um, did some great work for Asian American women and Asian communities. So it was a great achievement. And so I'm glad I did it. Same thing with the assembly. You know, there were so many people who said I wasn't ready, that I wasn't qualified to run, that I didn't have any experience running a campaign. By the way, all of those statements are true. I'm not saying it's not. <laughs> but you did it anyway. <laughs> right. Yes. Because, you know, and I think, you you know, you sort of have to have that belief that that you have something to contribute and you do bring things to the table. Absolutely. Even if you don't have answers for everything. And even if you don't check that every single qualification box, you can still contribute and you still bring something to the table. And so, you know, that's kind of the model that I use and um and it served me well sometimes it didn't I mean I failed just as much as I succeeded and so I'm not saying like just do it anyway all the time but you know if you really believe in something I would say do it anyway even well, if, if you, you don't, don't ask you don't get <laughs> <laughs> so um anyway that's my long-winded answer to that <laughs> okay okay no I think I think you highlighted a number of things there that are really important and I remember back in the early 80s, I um, I loved Susan Jeffers, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, right? I think that's right. Susan. I think that one's Susan. Um, great book, right? Because we are going to have fear sometimes, fear of failure, fear of success. But ask yourself, is it is it what you really want to, to your point? Like, is this a purpose that you're willing to go the mile for? Right. And and if you are, then put yourself out there. You, you're going to learn something no matter what happens. And, you know, that's just people. I think I think when you were talking about your mentor discouraging you, I mean. Where my head goes to is what was that person's reality at that time? Were they having their own struggles and you didn't know about those struggles. And so they could have been trying to protect you. They could have been, could be lots of different reasons. And so, you know, you, and this is our audience <laughs> for our audience, you know, who you are, you know, what you're capable of and what you're committed to achieving. And so if you know that, then go for it. If, and especially when you have a purpose. Yes. Yes. Um, I think, you know, just thinking back, I mean, I was very young at the time, but just thinking back, I think it really had to do with um, just, you know, women not in, like us not having enough seat at the table. Okay. It's really responding to that whole sexist attitude about how there only could be one woman on the board of directors, mm -hmm. you know, and so I think she really saw herself as the Asian woman spokesperson, right? And so anyone else who was trying to have a similar role, I think, was something that she did not want because she's sure. from that generation as well. You know, she's much older, more experienced. And I'm sure when she was like in her 20s, there could only be one Asian voice at the table. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if that makes sense. 100 percent it does. And, and that's why I say, like, what was her reality at that time? Right. And you see that where, you know, I've I've had clients in the consulting industry where they might dress very feminine and the token woman in the C-suite will say, oh, you need to be wearing navy or black suits like you can't dress like that. Like those are those are all those biases that show up. And, you know, you got to think about what makes you feel good. Right. Like yes. if, a, if, if a beautiful feminine dress makes you feel good, then that is exactly what you should wear because you're going to be at your best self. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's I mean, there's so many subtleties that happen uh, regardless of whether it's politics or it's, you know, corporate or private industry. Like we face a lot of barriers and it's up to us then to determine if we want to let that define us or if we want to make changes. So similar to yourself, you had a cause, right? Like you watched what happened to your sister and that became your purpose, your cause. And you continued to navigate and remove barriers to enable you to have impact and make a difference. 
uh, which is beautiful. And, you know, that's your legacy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. That's, you're very kind. <laughs> Well, it's it's true. And so, Mary, what what would you like to leave our audience with today? What would be your parting advice to the end? Because we have both men and women listening. So what would be your parting advice advice to them? Um, so, you know, I, I think I've answered 50 percent of that question just now. <laughs> so my advice is do it anyway. Um but in, in one of the chapters, um, I talk about mentors mm -hmm. because that's that term is used um, a lot. And, you know, I, tr I really wanted to just further define that that little bit because women run for office when they're recruited. You know, they don't tend, they don't really self nominate. And so recruitment efforts become very important um, for women and, to, and in order to achieve gender parity. Um, but what I really wanted to highlight in that chapter was um, a mentor who I had um, was a man. And many women I interviewed in this book had uh, really helpful male supporters and mentors. And so I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, studies have shown that when men talk about you know, breaking down barriers and talking about, you know, you know, sexist, um, you know, institutional level sexism and racism. When men are the messengers with other men, that's more effective than women talking to men. Sure. And so I wanted to highlight this because my mentor who sort of got me thinking about running for office is a man. And so I interviewed him. And when you talked about earlier, this, you know, feminine trait, he when he was in the legislature, he championed mental illness and mental health issues. And, you know, you, you didn't really see that back then. You know, that was sort of considered more feminine, um, you know, issue like women, like women talk, women did with mental health issues, you know, or mental health reform work. Um, and so I was really impressed and inspired by him. And and I thought, wow, you know, if he can do that, I can I can really you know, help so many people, I can do that job. And so he's the one who broke down that imagination barrier for me to be nice. to be able to run for office. And so it doesn't always need to be a woman role model is, is what yeah. I you know try to point out. And that men who are part of the the solution and, and they are men who could talk about um, institutional barriers and sexism and all of these other barriers that women candidates face. Um, in fact, that we can't get to that parity faster. Um, and so, yes, I really think that we need to work with everyone, not just not just women. And of course, you know, um, you know, that's women in politics is the focus of the book. But I thought it was important to incorporate um, what man what men can do and how they can play an important role in mentoring, teaching, and providing support to uh, women in politics. Yeah, that's lovely. Yes, absolutely. So I I, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, this has been a great conversation, and I'm just going to put your book up one more time. So our audience, I know some of you are listening via audio, some of you are listening via video. So I have Mary's book up. It's Women in Politi Politics, <laughs> Breaking Down the Barriers to Achieve True Representation. Encourage you to read it. There are so many fantastic insights from her book that are applicable regardless of whether you're you know, in a corporate leadership role, if you're in a community leadership role, a political leadership role. So many great takeaways from, uh, from her book. I, I really enjoyed it, Mary. And uh, I think that you know, you've you've highlighted a number of things that call out the challenges that that we still have as a society, and and definitely called out some of the systemic barriers that we have. That you know, those are some of the things we we've got to work on in order for us to get true representation. Thank you, Vicky. You summed it up very nicely. Appreciate that.
Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. And for our audience, if you're interested in learning more about your own leadership um, on our Will Empowered website, that's 1L, willempowered.com, you can actually take a free leadership quiz, which will give you insight as to how you're showing up as a leader. And if you have questions about our conversation today, Mary, how can people find you? I know you're on LinkedIn. Where else can they find you if they want to reach out? Yes. Um, the best way it, to, to contact me is through my website, okay. maryhayashi.com. maryhayashi.com. Okay, perfect. So I want to thank everybody again for joining us today. This has been a great conversation. We hope to see you on our next podcast and wishing everyone a fabulous day and we'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you.